So, guten Morgen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. Schön, dass Sie es trotz des goldenen Herbstes oder des goldenen Oktober, wie man schon schon sagt, hier ins Burgtheater, dass Sie sich hier ins Burgtheater verirrt haben. Ähm, wir können jetzt darüber spekulieren, warum. Äh, vielleicht ist es der Glaube äh, an die gemeinsame Zukunft in Europa. Äh, vielleicht ist es Ihre Liebe zum Thema des heutigen Tages oder vielleicht die Hoffnung, dass es nächstes Jahr nicht so schlimm wird bei den Europawahlen. Das, was Sie jedenfalls hier Abend heute sehen, ist, äh, sehen können, ist Glaube, Liebe, Hoffnung äh, von Oedon und von Horvath. <lacht> ähm, wir glauben, wir haben äh, heute Vormittag auch äh, großartige Darstellerinnen für Sie auf der Bühne. Ähm, allerdings hm, geht es nicht um Theater heute Vormittag, sondern wirklich um Realität, äh, um eine sozusagen umkämpfte Realität, weil vieles, woran wir geglaubt haben, was wir geliebt haben und was wir gehofft haben, dass immer bleiben wird, ist plötzlich in Gefahr. Ähm, äh, also ähm, glauben wir, dass wir das Thema, das wir heute gesetzt haben, richtig ausgewählt haben und dass das auch ein relevantes Thema ist für die Zukunft in der Art und Weise, wie wir hier in diesem Kontinent zusammenleben. Mein Name ist Boris Marte, ich bin Vorstand der Erste Stiftung und ich darf Sie auch im Namen des Instituts für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, im Namen des Burgtheaters und im Namen der Erste Stiftung herzlich heute früh hier begrüßen. Jalini, you want to say a word? Maybe just uh, to yeah. thank everyone for being here. Meine sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen. Uh, und so, uh, wie das Wetter heute Morgen war, hatte ich Sorgen, ob wir Sie hier begrüßen werden dürfen werden. Denn ich dachte, uh, es könnte sein, dass Sie Ihren Sonntagvormittag woanders verbringen. Also es ist wunderschön, Sie wieder bei uns zu haben. Das ist unsere letzte Debatte für dieses Jahr. Und dann fangen wir im Frühjahr nochmals in äh, 2019 an. Äh, das Einzige, was ich zu äh, Boris Martes Ausführungen dazu äh, hinzufügen möchte, ist, dass die Veranstaltung ist im Rahmen von einer strategischen Partnerschaft zwischen Erste Stiftung und äh, Institut für Wissenschaften von Menschen, äh, die zu äh, so einem Programm äh, Europe's Futures zusammen dazugehört und die Debatte zu der Zukunft Europas, was können wir dazu beitragen, ist ein zentrales Anliegen für dieses Thema, für dieses Programm. Insofern ich möchte mich ganz herzlich nochmal bei Ihnen bedanken und wir übergeben das Wort an den eingeladenen Gästen. Okay. Yes. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us on this beautiful Sunday Vienna morning. And uh, it shows the interest in the continent that we live in. This series debating Europe has been going on for, for many years for obvious reasons. We, we care about the continent we live in, but also we realize that it is confronted with many a challenge. Uh, today, there are elections in Bavaria that we are all, and in particular our friend Norbert Rodgen, are uh, waiting to see the results of, as the rest of us are, because Germany has such an in important role. Uh, in this uh, theater, uh, there is a show uh, by uh, Miroslava Svovilkova, Europa Pflicht nach Europa. So, everywhere, Uh, this, uh, and I'm sure in our families, a lot of debate about these issues. Uh, Europe Drifting, the title that we gave to this session, is one in which we, the 
uh, four organizations, the Erste Foundation, the Der Standard, uh, the Burg Theatre, and ourselves at the Institute for Human Sciences, where, by the way, we have a project called Europe's Futures that we're doing with uh, the Erste Foundation, think that we need to address head-on some of the problems, the challenges that Europe faces, and they are numerous, starting with the economic and financial crisis that began roughly around 2008 with the fall of Lehman Brothers Bank. It moved to Europe, and in some ways we're still living the consequences of that crisis. Uh, the fact that we have a country that for the first time wants to leave the European Union, the whole Brexit affair, that began on June 23rd, a few years ago, with the referendum. The challenge of Russia that had invaded Georgia in 2008, annexed Crimea, and uh, we have the war in the Donbass region. The migration crisis, obviously, and the way that Europe did not tackle in its immediate neighborhood a war thinking that it would go away and then basically had uh, a situation where <coughs> this oblivion to a neighborhood crisis blew up in, in its face in 2014-15. If you allow me, I will give a personal note to this. As a recent uh, inhabitant of Vienna for nearly two years now, I have w discovered the wonders of this city and its uh, environ of the neighborhood. And just recently, I visited two places, one that you all know, Kallenberg, where a Polish king, Jan Sobiecki, came to save uh, Europe and to save Vienna from the Ottoman siege. The other place I visited recently is a small village called, called Deutsch Wagram, where Napoleon defeated the Austrian forces, and before that at Aspern, where the Austrians defeated Napoleon. <laughs> And what these two places say is that tens of thousands of Europeans died in a war. No need to mention a visit to Mauthausen to recall the horrors of where we were. So Europe was basically founded to avoid uh, the soil of Europe being bloodied uh, again. And the personal note that I mention is that, that I come from a country that no longer exists. Uh, it's called Yugoslavia. It is today seven countries. And when war should not have happened at the end of the 20th century in Europe, it did. And we had to live through the darkest of examples of European history when we supposedly had overcome it, at least on European soil, namely military, violent, conflict, and death. And so, to discuss all of these issues on why we have Europe and why these challenges are so great, we have an extraordinary panel here tonight, and I would like to thank them from coming from different corners uh, of Europe. And I would like to very briefly introduce them to you. And, of course, to my right, uh, the Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria, who as the cliche goes, needs no introduction, but I still, for the benefit of those who don't know her, would like to say that uh, she has been minister uh, since December uh, in the new coalition government. She describes herself on her own personal website as journalist, lecturer, and energy analyst. She has a PhD in international law, has taught at the University of Vienna, for many years and joined the Federal Foreign Ministry in 1990 and served in Paris and Madrid and then left in 1998 to become a freelance journalist and expert on Middle Eastern and other affairs. She has authored a number of books and last but not least, uh, she is a true polyglot which she demonstrated eloquently in her UN General Assembly speech just last month. So welcome, Madam yeah. Minister. To my left is Madam Vesna Pusic, uh, who was a foreign minister and deputy prime minister of her country, uh, Croatia, uh, from 2011 to 2016. It is under her tenure that Croatia become, became the 28th member state of uh, the European Union. 
Vesna Pusic is an academic, a politician, and a social activist. She has been a tenured professor of sociology at the Faculty of Philosophy in Zagreb, but also uh, a founding member in 1990 of the Croatian People's Party, of which she was president in two terms from 2000 to 2008 and from 2013 to 16. On a somewhat more uh, deeper biographical, biographical note, in 1978, she was one of the founders of the first feminist organization in Yugoslavia. So welcome to Vesna Pusic. To my far left is Nathalie Nougaret, uh, a French journalist, currently editorialist on international affairs with the uh, British newspaper The Guardian. She began her uh, career in Paris with uh, the newspaper Libération, uh, was correspondent in Czechoslovakia. She then joined uh, Le Monde in Paris in 1996, specializing in foreign affairs, was correspondent in Moscow uh, and generally a specialist on the post-Soviet space, and then became director of Le Monde in 2013, after which, uh, after her tenure, she moved to London, where, as I said, she is with The Guardian. Welcome to Nathalie Nougaret. And last but not least in this properly gender-balanced uh, panel <laughs> uh, is the other male participant, uh, Norbert Röttgen, uh, who is a German politician with the uh, CDU, the Christian Democratic uh, Union of Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, he is a lawyer by training, but a politician for most of his career, led the young wing of the party, for several years and uh, became a member uh, of the Bundestag uh, for the first time in 1994. He is currently a member of the Bundestag and leads the most important uh, committee on foreign affairs and he has done so since 2014. He, in the first uh, Merkel cabinet, uh, served as the chief parliamentary secretary of the CDU and worked uh, very closely with Olaf Scholz, who is today the uh, SPD uh, Minister of uh, Finance in uh, the government. And uh, finally, he was a federal minister in the second Merkel government, Minister for the Environment for 2009 to 2012. Welcome to Norbert Rotgen. So, I will uh, start off with uh, a seemingly very general question, but maybe a kind of statement of, of feeling about Europe. As you know, uh, the singer Edward uh, uh, Bono was quoted recently in a conference where he came to Kiev, where he said, Europe is an idea, but it needs to become an emotion. So this is a question about ideas and emotion. And the question really is, what is Europe for you, and what does European unification mean for you? And I will ask Minister Madame Kneissel to begin. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning to each and everybody. Uh, emotions. I am much more into realpolitik, and I think also when we speak of Europe, we should always bear in mind that uh, these 28 member states still have uh, interests. And uh, we are sometimes under the fiction of the family and forget that within the Union there are numerous formats where countries are regrouping in order to get uh, certain things uh, advanced, done or, or better organized. And uh, we have that, for instance, in, uh, in the framework of foreign affairs. You have a rising number of smaller frameworks where these things are happening because it's about interests. And uh, since the title of today is Europe and not simply European Union, uh, I would also like to go beyond that EU uh, uh, legal and political order and framework 
And uh, for instance, uh, ever since I've assumed my office, going to Southeast Europe, I insist uh, to use the term Southeast Europe instead of using Western Balkans, which has been an, a notion coined by the European Commission some 18 years ago, uh, because we have uh, developed uh, terms of, uh, for geography which are inexistent. And uh, speaking, for instance, of uh, cities like Belgrade, Sarajevo, we put them aside, we put them into some sort of new category. And I think here we should be precise with history, geography, and language. So Europe as such, as long as I was still teaching the topic, uh, I also drew the attention of, of younger colleagues to the fact that uh, Europe as such, we do not really know where it ends, geographically speaking. We have uh, not this right idea. First time I went to Algeria, I remember very well, it was for me just the sister city of uh, Marseille. It's just the other side of the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean dimension, to me personally, has always been a very important aspect of Europe. I mean, nothing had been <coughs> brought about, neither in philosophy nor in culture, if there hadn't been the eastern Mediterranean shores from where speaking of the alphabet, coming from Ugarit via Byblos into Crete, thanks to Gatmos, if one believes the legend. Uh, so there has always been this very strong Mediterranean dimension, and then, of course, a, a canon of literature on which we rely. And uh, to my understanding, uh, literature in South America, whether it's um, uh, the, 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 the big narratives of, of Colombian storytellers or Tolstoy, they are all part of this European literature canon. So when you think of Europe, it goes far beyond the geographic, the legal and other matters. And uh, that, so uh, speaking about what it means to me, uh, to a certain sense, it stretches from, uh, from the literary circles of Bogota right into Algeria. It stretches into Alexandria, uh, where we once had also um, a setting of, of different languages and ideas. And then, of course, we have this political legal framework where, in my, uh, in my observation, we always have to be also aware of the fact that we are interest-driven and not just emotion-driven. Yes, in fact, uh, several political philosophers have talked about the uh, move from passions to interests as the process of enlightenment, where we subside our passions and try to see where our interests interact, notwithstanding the differences that exist between us, because those differences will always exist. The French will always have camembert, and uh, we will have beer in, in this part of the region, or rakia, etc. No one can take that away from us, but I think what we're looking for, at least in, in my view in the European Union, is how do we actually address the, what, what we call the, the global commons, which we cannot do by ourselves. Climate is sort of mm. the best example, but we will get to that. And I'm glad that you, you mentioned Southeastern Europe or, or the Balkans, which is also a geographic nomination because the current presidency of the uh, European Union is held by uh, this country and one of the uh, priorities is enlargement. But again, we'll, we'll come back to that a little later. Uh, let me ask Vesna Pusic about her view uh, on where she sees the importance of, of Europe today and of having a European Union. Let me first ask, uh, answer your first question. Okay. And this is what does Europe mean to you or to me? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's who I am. And everything else can then be added to this. I don't see it as being as broad as the minister has, has defined it, although I see, obviously, all these connections and influences. There is, there is no doubt about that. And in many ways, I think, in the European project, we need to go the sort of other way, in a way, because Europe, European Union, as an ongoing project, as a project that's, that's not finished yet, has always been an extremely rational project, if you think about it, and in that sense, very effective. It has been a project of uh, creating a unity that will prevent conflict on the continent. And this is one thing where all the countries uh, had 
a common interest. And it was a rational interest-based uh, project for many years. Probably one of the reasons why it sort of lost a little bit of its attraction is that it lacks this emotional aspect to it, that it lacks this identity aspect uh, uh, to it, or at least in public discourse, it lacks this, uh, this aspect. And this is why I wanted to start by saying, this is who I am. And this city is also who I am. And you know, if you, in a way, in this uh, you know, British philosopher's distinction of people being from anywhere, uh, being from somewhere and being from anywhere, I feel I'm from somewhere, and that somewhere is Europe. And it's also my street, and it's my town, and it's Croatia, and it's uh, Southeastern Europe, or Western Balkans, whatever you want to call it, but it's also Europe. And I think we do need to bring to this European project, on top of all the interests, which is definitely the case, on top of all the rational structures, which is also definitely the case, and it's also definitely Europe's history, it actually started as a, as a sort of rational thought after a collective horrible madness at the time when rational thought was a way out. At the moment, we, I think, need to add to this project something that actually affects us, something that's part of who we are. And this is how I feel. Okay, thank you very much, Vesna. <laughs> Nathalie Nougared. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, good morning, everybody. I, I was a student in Paris uh, in uh, November 89 when uh, the Berlin Wall fell and when I saw those uh, images on television I, I jumped onto a train, I, 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 I took my boyfriend and I, we jumped onto a night train um, to Berlin and I wanted to be there and this for me, I'm French, I live in London uh, but my sense of being European uh, crystallized in Berlin in 1989, and next year will be the 30th anniversary. And what did it mean to me, and what has it meant to me since then? It is essentially, uh, for me, the European project embodies an aspiration to uh, human dignity and togetherness in, div in diversity. Uh, we are based on uh, not just a geographical notion, which indeed can be discussed, but we are based on uh, the adherence to uh, democratic rule of law, social justice, uh, human rights, and solving disputes through, through dialogue, talking, not using weapons. And these, these, the, these, the combination of all these things make Europe a unique part of the world, which I think we should be proud of. Uh, that we, we, we have things in this part of the world that we know don't exist in the same way elsewhere. And I think to cherish that is our challenge today. And it's an emotional thing. It's, uh, it's, we should be proud and we should cherish, cherish what we have in this part of the world, not be so uh, you know, paranoid and, and fearful of, of sometimes each other. And the real politic dimension of it is very simple. Um, Europe represents today 7% of the world's population. In 1965, it was 13% of the world's population. Today, Europe represents 23% uh, of global GDP. Just in 2004, it was 31% of global GDP. If the realpolitik aspect is if we want to matter tomorrow, in tomorrow's world, if we want to sh try to shape the world, defend certain principles, uh, then we have, to, we have to do this together. It makes absolutely no sense to start pulling up walls <coughs> and, and going it alone. So uh, the emotional part is for me, Berlin 1989 as a French person, discovering the, whole, the rest of Europe, that Eastern and Central European uh, identity, which I ignored when I was in high school. I didn't know much about it. So I saw this as uh, European reunification. And the realpolitik is, it's ridiculous to think any single country can obtain more or achieve more on its own. We just have to work together and be together. Thank you, Natalie.
Well, I, I think Vienna is, is such an obvious place where not only to, to discuss Europe, but it's a, a town, uh, a city, and a country which was well aware of Central and Eastern Europe as opposed to Paris and France because it is so proximate. There's the history of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it was a frontline country where the Cold War wall uh, stood. Uh, Norbert Rotgen, uh, yesterday in Berlin there were 240,000 people by all accounts of the press uh, in a demonstration against nationalism or the, the, the spirits that are rising at, that are uh, creating fear uh, that maybe walls will be built. Um, where, do, where do you see uh, in your uh, personal life but also political life the importance of this project? Thank good morning, uh, first of all, and thank you for the invitation and giving us the opportunity even not to act, but to sit on and at least to speak on this stage so very famously. <laughs> thank you very much for this opportunity. And, and of course, I'm, I'm happy to also deliver my confessions. Perhaps first of all on politics. In my view and my idea of politics is very much that that politics always is a, a marriage or a merger of ratio and emotio. Mm -hmm. So, and if one, one piece of these two essential pieces is missing, the result is bad politics. So both have to coexist permanently. On Europe, and the emotion of Europe, when I'm, when I'm outside Europe, and the far away, not only geographically, but culturally, so more to the east than to the west, then in me the emotion of being a, Euro a European emerges. When I'm inside Europe, it's a matter of identity, as already has been outlined. I would describe myself as a German European. So this is my personal, political, but also very personal identity uh, from where I am acting as a politician and I am behaving as a family father and as a citizen. And essentially, what is Europe, what does Europe mean politically in our days? You mentioned the demonstrations against the re-emergence of nationalism, populism. We thought we had overcome definitely, historically, and we see how quickly this can re-emerge, I'm, I'm quite sure that we are in an in-between period of history. I think the long circle of post-war Europe is behind us, where we had 70 years of peace, where we thought we had entirely learned the lessons of history. You mentioned some events in history, uh, the, 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 the wars, the nationalism, what happened and what really characterized our European history. We are behind that. I think it started four and a half years behind us with the new, you already mentioned also that, the new Russian policy, which violated and put into question what we also had thought to have achieved for eternity, the European peace order. And now we are in an in-between period. The new world order has yet to emerge and to evolve. We are in a period where new struggles, conflicts, perhaps even wars are, 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 are conducted in order to, and, and, the, and there will be a historic result of a new balance or architecture of international power. And the very essence of Europe, at this critical juncture is quite similar as Natalie has put it. Will the Europeans be relevant at the end of this in-between period? Or will we transfer the dominance to others? We are not in a missionary way active in this world, but I think the Europeans are determined to preserve and assert their way of living, our values, our interests. You talked about, Euro, or you referred to European unification. I would perhaps not call it unification, but I am deeply convinced that European unity 
It's essential and crucial to preserve the ability of Europeans to remain relevant and to be able to assert our way of living in an ever more chaotic, less Western coined world. So, in a, in a nutshell, Europe and European unity is a necessity as a political concept in our days. Thank you, Norbert Rogan, for that. I, I would concur with, with your precise statement on the difference between unification and unity. I myself do not believe that there will be a United States of Europe, given our history, given the nation yeah. state, given the interests that the minister has talked about. But I think, uh, and thank you, Natalie, for mentioning the statistics that most of us know and that are so important and that lead me to the next question, in fact. And as you know, the second part of the title of this debate this morning is uh, what should be done. Um, we uh, seem to be outpaced, and the statistics speak about it, the fact that we are from, gone from 31% of global trade and economy to 23%, the fact that Silicon Valley has not happened in Europe, that the big tech companies are out there, that China is rising, that Africa is rising demographically. Yes, it's a bit further out there, but two billion people will be in Africa in about 30, 40 years. And that's why many European leaders are making the trip uh, to, to Africa to tackle at root causes maybe some of these issues. So uh, to you, Madam Minister, given that you are also in the, in the seat now, in the driving seat for these six months uh, of the European Union, do you feel that enough is being done to at least preserve the position that we have and not to be outpaced in economic security and some other terms by others? Well, the motto of our uh, presidency uh, was coined uh, protecting Europe and this uh, notion of protection goes far beyond uh, its uh, security dimension. It also goes into economics as has been already raised. It's um, how uh, can we position ourselves in terms of uh, rivalry from Eastern companies, be it uh, People's Republic of China or others, because their motto is what we cannot innovate, we acquire. Uh, and we have seen the tremendous transfer of uh, patents, licenses uh, to uh, East Asian companies. And uh, there has been, to a certain extent, even a sale out, one can say. And I think uh, at very late, uh, uh, stage, we are thinking more about uh, how to preserve vulnerable uh, strategic infrastructure. And uh, here we are not yet in the position, I think, in, of, of uh, being uh, sensitive enough about it and acting. And I, I may come back to the region of Southeast Europe. Uh, here we, uh, as a presidency, have a double uh, priority. It's not only about bringing this region closer to the European Union, against all odds, because I've recently had also a long debate on that uh, with Dutch colleagues. And the more you go to Paris, the more you go to the De Hague, uh, no way. We do not want to see this region uh, getting some sort of rapprochement uh, for various reasons. Um, so it's this region about its European perspectives, especially for young people who decide then, well, let's quit. Uh, we want to create our destiny somewhere else. And the other topic, of course, is the encroachment that we see, in particular through the One Belt, One Road project, going from the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean, through Turkey, through Greece, into Serbia, and uh, then all the way through uh, Croatia, Hungary, etc. And here, uh, I must say, if I may quote just one example, uh, a, a bridge project on the Dalmatian coast between Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, the Plechnik Bridge. Uh, uh, this bridge, uh, the, the tender um, um, that was given by the uh, European Commission, went to a Chinese state company, uh, even so other companies uh, would have had also interesting or higher quality tenders. Uh, and the whole thing is financed by more than 550 million EU tax money. Uh, so we invite uh, Chinese companies to bring their, uh, their raw materials, to bring their uh, workforce, 
and uh, the debt the debt trap that uh, comes along uh, if you take a country like Montenegro, uh, which has also um, given a number of projects to, to Chinese companies, uh, and the day a number of countries will not be in a position to pay back in due times to pay the interest rates that are often much higher than the interest rates that would have been offered by the European Investment Bank, for instance. Uh, so you see that uh, a number of countries, be they in the region or be it inside Brussels, are not in our mind, or in particular in my personal opinion. I've raised this topic at various occasions inside uh, the councils, in, in bilateral talks, and I, I, I see that there's not enough attention paid to the whole story. So, yes, we are sandwiched. Yes, there is a tremendous uh, rise of, uh, um, of strategic investments going into a vacuum that we have here and there, going into countries uh, which, uh, uh, which tried to overcome the debt crisis by then opening up their airports, their ports uh, to Asian companies or to wealth funds from the Gulf states, uh, you name it, you have it. And here I think our motto of protecting Europe goes beyond external border projection, it goes beyond uh, the, uh, the permanent topic of migration, it also goes into how to preserve competition, how to preserve also all the money that our governments invest into education, into research, uh, because uh, if you sell then all these licenses and patents uh, to a company that pays a bit more, uh, we are running into, into uh, troubled waters. Uh, indeed, you raise uh, one of the very important questions, and that is, you know, are we, uh, as, as a continent and individual member states, cognizant and aware of the fact that strategically China is positioning itself in a, in a very slow-paced but very determined way? If you look at statistics, the, the biggest volume of investments of China are in the UK and Germany. Uh, we are sort of taking crumbs off, off this table, but it begs the bigger question, all these countries, talking about Southeastern Europe, need infrastructure investments. Yeah. Why is there not a greater strategy on the part of the European Union exactly. to invest rather than having Chinese? But maybe Vesna, uh, within the larger framework of, of this question, are we being outpaced by, by the others, whether it's uh, the US or China uh, and in other ways? Is there enough being done at this moment? Is there enough awareness? Maybe awareness there is, but how do you see this, this issue? I think it's important for Europe to figure out what is the area in which it competes. It definitely has to compete with the big powers. Uh, China, United States, politically also the Russian Federation. Uh, however, it will never have, or certainly not in the foreseeable future, have um, the one advantage where, which all these big powers have, whatever state uh, they're in otherwise, and this is one government that makes decisions and that makes the whole functioning of the system much easier. It has one market, it had, for a long time, I would say, um, a comparative or an area in which it could compete and where it had a comparative, <coughs> potentially a comparative advantage. And this is the people, the education, so to say, people with quality, uh, with quality education. This, as everybody who has ever been in politics knows, uh, education is always a big topic right before the elections, and right after the elections, it's off the table. But actually, and it's usually uh, given to somebody who's not that politically strong in the government. However, if you look, I checked the PISA results for the um, European countries, 70 countries among which all the 28 member states. This is a test of 15-year-olds in all our countries, in math, sciences, and literacy. In the first 10, in math, there was only one EU member state, Estonia, of 1.8 million people. In uh, sciences, only two, Estonia and Finland. 
and in literacy, Estonia, Finland, and Ireland. This, I think, is All other countries probably, are from Asia, or...? <laughs> they're from uh, Asia, most, mostly. They were, well... United States wasn't high up, but mm. most of the EU uh, countries were between 20th, 20th and 50th place out of 70. This, you know, you can say this is not tragic, but for a continent or for a political entity, let's say, European Union in its, in its um, I would say, way to actually encompass uh, all of or most of, of uh, Europe, uh, this is not good enough. This is very dangerous. If we had another area where we can excel or where we can make up for that, we might say, okay, we will you know, catch up eventually, but at the moment, this is not so important. I think at the moment, that is hugely important. The election results in many European countries, I think, are directly or indirectly connected to that. The uh, famous sentence, I love the poorly educated, is something that goes contrary to what we always thought Europe was all about. It was about giving people chances to improve themselves, to be better, to uh, you know, sort of move ahead of what their parents had. If you start lagging back in education, as I think this, this uh, statistics show, um, that, I think, is probably even medium term and certainly long term, the most dangerous thing for Europe and the most dangerous thing for European unity. We were all over ourselves and our neighbors and everybody else about migration, for instance, and about refugees. This was a huge problem. Everybody had this on its uh, agenda. We are still trying to deal, deal with this, which I think is a way smaller problem than losing the re education race and lagging back in the standards of education. And thank you, but... And this, both in terms of, of uh, Europe, Europe's future, but also in terms of who we elect. This is going to depend, in five years' time, this is going to depend on that. Just to finish with a short sentence. In Macedonia, a small country in southeastern Europe or in the, in the Balkans, there was for almost 10 years a government that tried to persuade uh, the people that they were direct descendants from uh, Alexander, Alexander the Great. Nobody believed it, I mean, it was funny, and, you know, and now the government changed, they're doing something about it. I was talking to some friends there, and I said, you know, well, okay, now you're getting out of this, and you know, this is not something that's realistic. And she said, no, no. The kids that are coming out of school, since this has lasted, and 10 years, it's not such a long time, the kids that are coming out of school actually believe that. And they think that this new proposal by the government, this new agreement with the Greeks, is actually affecting their identity, because in 10 years' time, they manage to you know, sort of implant that notion through education in their sense of, of who they are. So even in relatively short periods of time, this can make a huge difference. Thank you. I'd also like to come later maybe to, to the issue of do we have enough civic education in Europe which helps uh, younger people understand the values on which we are trying to base this project that, that we call Europe and, and the European Union. But Natalie, you, you gave us the, the statistics that are, I think, so important to uh, remind us and, and make us realize that we are backsliding on, on some of these big issues. There's often sort of flippant talk about 
well, maybe Europe will become the museum, the Venice of the world, where people will come and we'll be basically catering uh, to the Chinese and the Africans who will like to come and see this wonderful city. How do you see, is, where is the gap, where is the lack in addressing this gap that we are seeing uh, in the fast pace of change that the world is in? It, it, seems, it seems to me that, um, that um, Europe has no chance of uh, being a big player, whether it's alongside the Silicon Valley giants or in um, dealing rationally uh, from a position of advantage with a large, a large, play, a large country like China. It, it will have no chance of playing any of these roles if, if, it, if it falls prey to the kind of uh, demagogy, dem, dem, demagogy, de, demagogy and populism that uh, exists within some of its uh, political scenes. And um, I have, you know, I, I, I think that um, the, the notion that we would be sitting here, and I'm going to be speaking very personally, uh, the notion that we would be sitting here on a stage uh, with a representative of a, of a European government that is in coalition with the far right in itself says something about the problem we have in Europe. And this is not limited to Austria, although I think Austria is a, 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 a flashpoint. Um, we, if we start normalizing, if we start normalizing the discourses that come out of political parties uh, one of them having allowed uh, Minister Kleisel to, to join government, then Europe is in, in danger. Why? Because uh, these political parties have no answers to the, to the questions that we really problem, face. These, these no, political no, parties no, have no, no answers. No, no. I mean, I do, I do not have to stand this kind of thing. You know. no, no, no. I mean, either, you know. No. So, can I, can I continue? No. Or, can, can I continue? Or? No, I, 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 if you have a problem with the simple fact that I'm here, I'm uh, saying, then I can I'm also say, leave. I'm I saying also if leave, we really, normalize, I'm saying if we normalize yeah. the discourse of political parties, including the political party that, has, and what that is, supports and what, what you, is now the then we are in. A, then we, I'm here you, because you, Europe is about dialogue. Yeah. But so I want can to you say what I think. Explain me what is the problem that you have with the Austrian government? I think you are, not I just think this government as a includes a political party that has helped you get into government which has no solutions, has no solutions to offer for Europe as we discuss the very real challenges that Europe faces. You have no solutions, whether it's on migration, whether it's on economic competition, whether uh, it's me, on Madam, defending you, 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 the, the values just, we care you about. You are now just bashing a government. We, uh, we, we started our debate with the fact that no country by itself can make a solution. And now you say you, the Austrians, you don't offer a solution. That's I'm a tremendous the, contradiction in your logic. I'm saying the political party that brought you to power. But, uh, but sorry, you, I mean, either you stick to your logic. <laughs> I mean, I, I, this is a, I'm not, I really, I don't want to stand this kind of applause. So I have no problem in leaving also. No, no, please, please don't leave. We are yeah. here to debate about different points yeah. of view. And it should, be, uh, done not a, it should be done in a logic way, and not just in this kind of very, uh, I mean, in, in this kind of bashing uh, that, uh, that is there. And, and it's and illogic bashing even. I mean, coming from France, uh, maybe you also have had the, uh, the possibility to study some of the logic. Sure. And I don't see any logic in your... In the beginning you say, we all started off by by being convinced of the fact that no country can do it by itself. And now you say, you, the Austrian government, you are not offering any solution to anything. I mean, either we do it in tandem, you know, and going to the Council of Foreign Ministers, and I'll go again tonight to the Council of Foreign Ministers, and I'm wondering how many of my colleagues will be there tomorrow, you know, whom I, most of, often of the time I don't see contributing to a debate on how, what to do about Syria, what to do about the Iran, this, uh, uh, this armament treaty. Most of the time, the so-called big ones are not represented on ministerial level. I miss my colleagues from the founding states of the European integration. We, the Croatians, the Maltese, Cyprus, we are there for the entire day, but I don't see my colleagues from the big countries in order to talk about a solution. 
So sorry, we, the Austrian government, and I, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, I'm there in, in order to try to find a solution, in order to contribute. But I don't see my colleagues from the other big countries. Can I? Why, let, let me just push you, uh, Madam Minister, on, on this issue. Why are they not there? Is it that they are doing this by themselves, exactly. between, themselves between themselves, without the rest of you? Exactly, that's the fact. Uh, let me go to, to Norbert Röttgen uh, on, on this issue of the challenges that come to us, the external challenges to the European Union. Uh, and given that you are the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the, of the Bundestag, uh, on, on the issue of transatlantic relations, and uh, Natalie mentioned the, the figures, but in today's world, which is defined by the liberal international order, the core is the transatlantic relationship. We depend so much on each other. You just look at the trade flows, not to mention any statistics, but if any of that were to be cut, both the US and Europe would, would suffer tremendously. This is now being challenged by the presidency and the administration of, of Donald Trump. Uh, that is really undermining tectonically some of the bases of that historical relationship since 1945. How do you see that in terms of Europe's future going ahead? There's lots of talk that Europe must become more independent in security and, and defense terms without losing the NATO pillar, that it needs to seek other ways. And basically, uh, and, and you talked about the change in the international order, that American security umbrella that allowed Europe to become what it was from 1945 has definitely gone away. Absolutely. And um, just to summarize, we are living in a world, in a different world. We are facing a different world than we had had over 70 years. And in the, in the Cold War period, and I would say regarding Europe, mainly the nice time afterwards. In the Balkans there, in Yugoslavia, and former Yugoslavia, there were not that nice times after Germany yeah. re reunification. But in general, we really had decided for the European peace order, and now, for some years now, we are facing a very fundamentally shifting different world. I do not want to, to summarize all the shifts because we know them all. The transatlantic relationship, the being outpaced technologi technologically, but perhaps by, by China, the, the mega geoeconomic and geostrategic power project of Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the refugee crisis, uh, Turkey turning away from a democracy and a rules, uh, 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 rule of law country to an autocratic country, and so on. So uh, these are the times we are facing, and regarding the uh, and, and this, of course, makes necessary in order, I would say, to survive not physically but politically regarding our values and interests. It would require a response given by the West, the West in a normative sense. So Australia and Japan also part of the West in that sense. And what do we see in the transatlantic relationship? That also the West is put into question from its very core, from the United States, from Washington, the President of the United States. So this is a completely new situation, and this shows, as the Chancellor, the German Chancellor, outlined before the election, in a famous Bavarian Bierzelt speech, she said we have to become more independent. We have to take our fate into our hands. We have to learn as Europeans that we not any longer can completely rely on a American security engagement as we have uh, enjoyed and seen uh, during the Cold War era. And my analysis is that this has come to a kind of climax under the presidency of Donald Trump, but the old times will not come back even after Trump. Because every candidate for the presidency and every president following Donald Trump will have to deal much more intensively with domestic problems and challenges and can't say to his voters, uh, we, we, our first priority is to invest in European security, 
the, the, and, we, and, and the, the Europeans, we don't claim and, and require them to, to, in, to do more for their own interest. So, at this point, definitely, the Europeans have to wake up. And I agree with Natalie that nationalism, populism, is definitely the opposite of, of the attitude we have to bring in in international relations. We have to bring in more Europe. We have to be more active, more open, because if we continue, or if we continue to turn a blind eye to all these challenges, then the problems will come to us. So we have to be proactive. But it's not only the temptation of nationalism, populism. I think we also have to talk about the weaknesses of the center. In Germany, I would say the AfD voters, a minority of their voters are ideological extremists. The majority of these voters are dissatisfied with the traditional parties. So we have also to learn a lesson. What is the answer? What is to do? Are we really sufficiently active in forging the European ability to respond to what we have seen? I would say no. So what are the recipes? Are we really responding? Are we really thinking, analyzing, uh, forging concepts, how to bring in more Europe in order to contribute to a little bit more rational, responsible world? And I think this has to be done. It is urgently to be done because uh, the unraveling has already uh, achieved in Europe, not only in Poland, not only in Hungary, but for example, in the Italian government and in Italy. Madam Minister, given that, that Austria is now presiding, uh, let me ask you the, the following question in, this, in the sense of what should be done and what are we doing or, or not doing. And, and it goes to, let's say, one of the five scenarios that have been outlined as a possible uh, next dynamic for Europe. Given what, what you just said, which, which is sort of a, a, a wake-up call that you go to sessions of foreign ministers and some of the key ministers are not there or already speaks to a weakness, I would say. But does that mean that we are, to speak very simply, dependent on the famous Franco-German couple now that the Brits are, are exiting? And how do you, the Maltese and the Croatians, tackle this issue? Where, where, is, where is the intermediate step to this? Mm -hmm in finding the way forward for Europe. Yeah, thank you very much for this very pertinent question, although to hook up on the, uh, on the rather, uh, well, uh, uh, offensive way that was raised beforehand. Uh, let me add to that another example. On Monday, we had in Barcelona 10 years of uh, Union for the Mediterranean. Um, ministerial conference and who uh, developed Medit Union for the Mediterranean, it was the French government. There was no French minister, there was no Italian minister. We had an Israeli minister there. We had, uh, we had guests from Morocco. The entire Mediterranean plus European Union. Uh, so this was also, once again, very telling, in particular for the countries from the southern and eastern shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, there, and it was not me, it was my colleague from Greece, Nico Kotsias, who said, this is another sad example that we see that those who even developed such fora, like the Union for the Mediterranean, are not present. And, uh, and it's just telling. So to answer your question, what can we do? Uh, you can... Uh, um, what we have seen, and I said it in my very first intervention, we see the uh, rise of smaller formats. Uh, we see a stronger cooperation in Southeastern Europe. As the Austrian presidency, and for many other reasons, We've always been pushing for the EU perspective for Southeast Europe. Now, this is not only us. Bulgaria, as the preceding chairmanship did it, Romania will continue it. We have Croatia in 2020. So we are not going to reinvent the wheel in these six months, Mrs. Nugeret. We are just advancing a lot of files, and this is what we are contributing as the Austrian governments. You're not going now to, to, to make the magic key solution about uh, Macedonia or about others. 
As Austrian government, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, for instance, I hosted numerous talks between Skopje and Athens, Indiana. That's, for instance, what we did. Okay. And, uh, and here, in order to, uh, to, to bring certain topics uh, about, it is about regional cooperation that you see more and more. And for instance, in Tirana, uh, two weeks ago, we hosted together with Albania uh, a forum where we would like to see the candidate countries and those who have not yet candidate status to also work together in a more regional way to convince the sceptics in The Hague, in Paris, Yes, we can solve certain issues. Yes, we can solve uh, economic cooperation. And this is where we put our efforts behind, either as hosts, other, uh, other sometimes as facilitators, in order to bring the one or the other meeting, be it in the region or in Vienna, on board. And, uh, and here we see the breaking down in smaller formats, because it's uh, sitting in Dublin, you have uh, different geographic and, and cultural socialization, not caring out so much about what will happen next in Macedonia than, as you said in the beginning, when you're in Vienna or when you are in, uh, in Zagreb. Mm. And this is, this is moving on. Mm. Right. May, may I just you? jump in yeah. regarding, <laughs> regarding this question of smaller formats or forging groups? of acting, pro-acting, going ahead uh, member states. Because I, I think what is necessary is the emergence of Europe as a foreign policy actor. We have been a very successful internal project so far, and now we have to go into the world, define our role, and be active. Will that happen on the level of the European, of the 27 European, of the Europe of 27? I doubt it, because our frictions and disagreements are quite fundamentally, so I do not see that we have sufficient consensus to define this European role outside. So I think we have to also, in this crucial field of foreign and security policy, to start with a group of states going ahead forging a foreign policy group, not against the European Union, but doing something, forging, developing a policy for the Middle East. So far, it is Mr. Putin and Mr. Erdogan who decide upon the question whether we will have a new refugee influx uh, due to a, a, a humanitarian crisis in Idlib, in Syria. Uh, we do not, we are divided vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, they play the game, the Chinese, very happily, divide et impa. And we talked earlier about the transatlantic relationship. So my proposal to the question, what can be done, is to do something to emerge as, on the field of foreign policy by forging a group uh, whose task is to, uh, to work out agreements on foreign policies and go ahead, be open to other members, but starting as a group. Uh, Vesna Pusic, given that you were uh, minister for many years and not only helped your country make it into the European Union, but you were around this table for, for many years with all of these actors that Minister Kneissel was talking about. How, how do you see what Norbert Rodgen said and what has been talked about? There, there has, let's, let's, let's be frank, there's always been a Europe at multi-speeds. It's never been always one Europe moving on all issues together. There have been concentric circles on certain things. There have been opt-outs on Schengen, on, on financial, on, uh, on other issues. Do you see this, what Norbert Rogan suggests, as a way forward? And how do then the states who do not partake in it, do they feel as second-rate member states? Or what should they do to join the quote-unquote avant-garde? I thought that what was said was extremely interesting, uh, especially comparatively, and maybe uh, people didn't pay enough atten attention to this fact. What the minister said that foreign ministers of big countries are not coming to the Foreign Affairs Council. I stopped going to the, I was going to the Foreign Affairs Council mostly every month for over four years. Stopped going three years ago, a little under three, three when years ago. Tenure ended. 
when I, so, yeah, when we lost elections. Um, <laughs> this, uh, so you didn't lose interest, but <laughs> <your. laughs> it was unthinkable throughout my tenure that minist foreign ministers of big countries wouldn't sit around the table. Laurent Fabius, here and there, the French foreign minister would leave and, and uh, you know, leave somebody else in, in his place, but he was always there, at least for part of the time. Everybody else, from the, you know, uh, the, the big member states, was there all the time. And what you're saying to me shows that something has also changed there. Uh, there were always, of course, different you know, Grammys and groups that, that uh, discussed things in corners or in separate meetings or in smaller, smaller groups. Um, for instance, it always included me when it was the Balkans, but not when it was you know, something else. But in the big meetings, all the ministers were there and took very active part, regardless of what was being discussed. So although it's obvious that you have different levels, you very much felt part of everything. Maybe not with the same influence, not maybe, obviously not with the same influence, because simply you know, your, your capacities are different, your strength is different. But in some issues that, that are really close to home and where you could contribute, um, you definitely had the whole audience. And actually, I can tell you of a project that we thought of, Bosnia-Herzegovina was blocked for years in trying to hand in its uh, application for membership because it had a catch-22 between the way the Constitution sets up the, their institutions and the ruling of the European Court of Human Rights, not to bore you with this whole thing, but these, they couldn't implement that ruling because the Constitution prevented it from being implemented. And it was always running against that problem and couldn't, couldn't sort of reach the, uh, the next stage. And we thought in our ministry of a way how maybe this could be overcome. And I was aware that if Croatia came there on its own saying, ah, we thought up of this solution, probably it wouldn't fly. I mean, everybody looked at me saying, oh, this is nice, but maybe it wouldn't fly. But if we got some of the bigger countries on our side, so I went to the that time foreign minister of Britain, William Haig, and uh, Frank-Walter Steinmeier just became foreign minister of Germany. And they looked at it, discussed it, added something, subtracted something, and decided that that was going to be the German-British proposal. And it became the German-British proposal, but the content was very much what you know, we came, came up with, and then everybody supported it, and as a result of changed approach by the European Union based on this support from these two countries uh, and then everybody else, Bosnia-Herzegovina was able to hand in its, its uh, application. So you definitely as a small country needed to, how can I say, be more <laughs> diplomatic or, or cleverer but you could do things. You definitely could influence thing, things precisely because what the minister was saying wasn't the case then. Because these guys were there. They were, they were actually take, taking part in it. And why has this changed? I think this is an extremely important and telling uh, uh, information that this has changed, I think, because actually at the moment there is way less trust mm. among different member states, unity, people are scared of each other, uh, in the sense, not you know, physically, but scared in the sense of politically how that uh, will work, how that will be communicated. Um, what we used to be so sure of 
which are the famous European values, which now everybody is interpreting in every which way, which I think is not true. I mean, European values were always rule of law, human rights, minority rights, including uh, gender, LGBT, uh, uh, e ethnic, you know, all of that. Uh, so this is not any more certain. And in many ways, I think that the, the refugee crisis has also somehow, if not formally, psychologically, legitimized this two classes of citizens. Now, these people come and then some have more rights and some have less rights. And this is, I think, impossible to deal with in a democracy because the prerequisite is that you are politically equal. We are all different. There are no two you know, people who are the same. But in the sense of our political rights and entitlements and obligations, this is the, the sort of prerequisite of democracy, we have to be even in order for the system to, uh, uh, equal, I mean, in order for the system to function. And this, I think, has been to some extent uh, disrupted. And then all of this, this whole story that, that, that came out, that all of a sudden European ministers, people who decide on things, are behaving in this, in this way, and only in the last few years, is, I think, to a large extent, also uh, the same phenomenon. Time, time. <laughs> Time, as always, is a scarce resource. Wow. We have about 15 Sorry. more minutes. But so let me move on uh, fast to, to Natalie Nogaid, trying to link up some of these issues. Um, uh, Syria, Syria, the Middle East was mentioned. Uh, Europe is somehow blatantly absent. I mean, it's, as Norbert Grotkin said, it's, it's Russia and Turkey, but it's also uh, Ir Iran uh, and uh, and, and Europe doesn't seem to have a grip on this thing that exploded into its face uh, in, in 2014. Uh, Natalie, you, you, are, you are French and have been a, a prominent journalist uh, uh, of France and now at, at The Guardian. Uh, what is to be done? Well, obviously, President Emmanuel Macron has come forward as a light uh, in uh, what in 19, uh, 2016 looked a, a bit as a darkish uh, period. He came with a very strong optimistic message and a positive message on Europe and, and won very con convincingly in France. And he is one of the drivers, his, his speech at the Sorbonne. Obviously, the, the German side of the couple is somewhat lame at this moment, but, but we'll get to, to Norbert Röttgen and, and that. And, uh, because Thank you for the warning, <laughs> so I can start. <laughs> yeah, you can start thinking yeah. of your response. But, you know, let's face it and, and be honest to ourselves, this is still the sort of axis, the, 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 para, the, the, the two big countries that, that made Europe after, after World War II with, with the other founding members. Uh, how, how do you see France's role in answering this question? What is to be done? Uh, you know, how do we tackle the, 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 the pace that we're going at as we go into the European parliamentary elections in a few months' time? Thank you for this question. Um, as, I, as I don't represent my, my, my country of birth or citizenship, and I consider myself as a European with multiple dimensions, I don't believe in the notion of there are two categories of people, people from somewhere and people from nowhere. I think we have all multiple, multiple origins, uh, as Visna said, and I, 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 I want to speak from that, from that point of view. But so, you do know so about like, France a little more than the rest I do of know, us. <laughs> I do, do know France, but what I wanted to say, and because you raised the issue of the European Parliament elections, the European Parliament elections is an affair of citizens, of all, all the citizens of the European Union. It's not an affair of just you know, nation states battling it out. Uh, defending their interests. And this is the, the affair of the European citizens, and so we all have to go and vote. And what I think is fascinating in this time in Europe is that um, for the, I believe that for the first time we have genuine debates 
which concern all the citizens across our cultural and national borders in a way that I, I think has never existed before. We know we have concerns that we share. You know, how do you, how do you defend your, 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 your social rights, your job rights? How do you defend, uh, how do you uh, embrace the notion of diversity or, or non-diversity, the relation between state and religion? Uh, how do we deal with the crises around us? You mentioned Syria, there's Ukraine invaded by Russia, uh, and, and many, many sources of instability. We all know we share common concerns, actually. And what's going to happen next year, at these, in seven months, literally, in these elections, is I think we will have to decide and choose, and it, it's not necessarily a binary <coughs> choice, but we will have to uh, d decide and choose whether uh, parties, political forces across Europe who exist in different countries, not just in this country, in my country in France, in uh, Sweden, in, in Germany, whether the parties and political forces that represent a threat to rule, democratic rule of law and a threat to our capacity of working together as, as, common, as Europeans and not just clashing on the nation-state basis, whether we want to give these political forces a chance. And I believe, uh, with all due respect, that uh, the minister uh, uh, we are debating with uh, is part of that problem because she, uh, she uh, as a representative, <laughs> as a, as a, as a representative, as somebody who's come to power with the support of a party that has roots in, in, in neo-Nazism, a party that has accepted the annexation of Crimea by Russia as something that was perfectly fine, the first uh, change of borders in Europe since the Second World War through unilateral use of force, uh, a party that has an agreement with Russia's uh, Kremlin-condoned United Russia Party, a party that has promoted repressive legislation against minorities, whether uh, uh, um, uh, gays or, or other, or, or supposedly, you know, extremists. That's how they label opposition people. So I think that this, 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 uh, this, this points to exactly the choice we have. Uh, and it's not a question of defending just one country, Austria or France, or it's about defending the values that we care about. And I think uh, in 2019, again on the anniversary, uh, close to the anniversary of Europe's coming together in, in 89, uh, we will have this absolutely existential choice to make. And I, I, this is why I welcome debates like this, but I think they should be about exactly what matters and not fake problems, which is who has come to this council meeting or not, or, you know, this, these are fake problems. The real problems, the, 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 real prob the real problems are about what really matters to us in all our, in all our diversity. And I know that in Austria there are people who, who think like this, and I'm certainly not uh, intending, as I criticize the minister, to criticize Austria, although she wants you to believe that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I wonder why. Minister, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you uh, immediately. We, we have the European elections uh, in, in May. Uh, there are uh, coalitions, uh, as far as I can understand, President Macron has made an election with the, uh, an alliance with the Dutch Prime Minister uh, Rutte. How, how do you see Europe going into, into these elections? Well, since I'm not adhering to any party, Madam, and also to some parts of the audience, I'm neither campaigning nor am I in any way involved. I'm concentrating on my work as Minister for Foreign Affairs of Austria. And that's what I do. So I'm not at all involved, and I cannot really can give you any clear-cut comment, because if I were involved for a party, then I, then I could give you a better insight on how this or that party is involved. Like this, I'm also somebody who observes it, and uh, what I... I, I might hope, as a citizen, is that maybe the, particip the participation uh, rate might be higher than we had at the lex last elections, because I remember that there were some countries, especially among those who had adhered to the EU only in 2004, uh, voters were not beyond 20 percent. 
So uh, then also we are back to representation and you might ridiculize that I have mentioned inter alia that ministers don't show up at ministerial councils. This is not a fake fact. This is something that is important because an ambassador, a number two or three of a delegation cannot decide, cannot participate in a debate on Syria, for instance, in the same way like a minister can. And uh, so when it comes to the elections, I am somebody who observes these elections, like many <coughs> other citizens do, but I am not campaigning. Uh, as I promised you all, <laughs> Norbert Röcken will give us the, the point of view from Germany of how, how does one move forward, uh, because Germany and France remain. Uh, Germany, uh, if I can say it a bit colloquially, got stuck into its own internal political uh, coalition forming uh, challenges uh, and thus what we expected would be a new momentum after the election of, of Macron didn't happen. Uh, all sorts of uh, important projects on moving the Eurozone for forward on Macron's idea of a European budget, etc., financial minister, are all stalled for the moment. The citizens of Europe, as, as we all agree, are angry, uh, are awaiting a, a signal of the movement forward, and uh, expect, uh, as we all know, protection and opportunity. This is what Europe gave. Wh where is Germany at this point in time on these forward-moving issues? Perhaps to try to make good for, for what you described <laughs> in, your, in your question, I, I have, I want, I have, uh, I found a solution to one problem. Good. Uh, because uh, I I'm, I'm now de have decided that I will ask Heiko Maas whether he really does not uh, attend and show up in the ministerial meetings uh, in good. the European Union. And if so, I will offer to replace him. <laughs> um, <laughs> apart from that, yes, you're right. Take alone, and we have mentioned different areas where Europe is absent to the detriment of our interests. And the Middle East is one example for that. It's besides, it's our neighborhood. It's not in the neighborhood of the United States. And I have to admit uh, that Germany is reluctant to present its ideas how to forge European foreign policy activity and initiatives. Why is that, Norbert? It's, a, it's a, for different reasons. I'm not here in a, in a partisan mission, of course, but one example where we, are, where we are disappointing is we will have a NATO stabilization and training mission to Iraq. But the SPD was absolutely determined that Germany not take part in a NATO mission in Iraq in order to stabilize this country. This is, the, this is the absolute opposite of what is necessary. We are, particularly Germans and others, are criticizing, rightly, Mr. Trump for weakening and putting into, in, uh, putting into, uh, into question even NATO as one of our pillars of security. But when it comes to action, not to rhetoric, it's the Germans who are not ready to join that. Why, why is that in general? It's not only the SPD. I would say, it, it entails to present uncomfortable truths to the electorate. There is a kind of desire not to get confronted with these complicated, ugly realities, where you have to, if you honestly deal with these topics, you have to make the case for more engagement for more commitment, for more funding, for sending people into that. On all sorts, financial resources, human resources, whatever. Taking a political risk. And it's so much comfortable to not to speak about these re new realities. When the refugees were in the camps in Lebanon and Jordan, nobody in Europe talked about the refugee crisis. There even seemed not to be a refugee crisis because as long as the refugees were not in Europe. This crisis did not exist, so we turned a blind eye. The World Food, food, the world food Program sent an alarm to the world and said, we need more funding because we have more refugees. What was the reaction of most of 
the, uh, of the uh, European governments, including the German government, I don't know how the Austrian government reacted, it was to even decrease the fundings to the World Food Program and not to increase it. So this was one, one decision which, which really uh, uh, made the refugees leave the, the camps in Jordan and Lebanon and try to cross the Mediterranean in order to come to Europe. And when they arrived at Italy, in Germany we did not say we have a European refugee crisis. Only when they knocked at the German doors, then all out of a sudden we said, oh, we have a European crisis when refugees are coming to Germany. So I think this is a challenge and matter for political leadership to have the courage to take the risk to talk about a new reality which is really threatening on very, very different fronts, from the technology, uh, from the demography in Africa, from the crises and conflicts and wars in Middle East, and, and, and. And we have not introduced a new reality uh, into the European, perhaps particularly German comfort zone we are enjoying, and the result is that we lose one result of this, is that we do not develop ability to respond, to exert influence, but that we permanently remain reactive and prove ourselves to be powerless. And the result of that, again, is that those who offer the simple answer, uh, don't go into this, these conflicts, Take the America first, the Germany or French or Austria first approach, so decommit to this world that these populist and national simple answers get more and more traction in our democratic societies. Let, let me just say that we are now uh before our final round, and I will ask Minister Kneissel to both respond and react and, on, and on, then... on Syria in particular. Yeah. I mean, Syria is a microcosm of the dilemma. And uh, in my speech, which you kindly uh, mentioned at the beginning uh, to the General Assembly, I started off in Arabic, and in Arabic, I uh, quoted Inter Elia Bertolt Brecht, the Moritat of the Three Penny Opera, the very last lines. Uh, those who are in the dark and those who are in the light. And we get lost in the United Nations, in the EU, in semantics. We right now have inside the Council of Foreign Affairs uh, an ongoing uh, semantic dispute, should we speak about reconstruction, stabilization, or humanitarian assistance when it comes to Syria. And uh, here, uh, I myself and I think some other members of the uh, Council have a very pragmatic approach quoting those who are working there, the ICRC and others. The moment people have a minimum of electricity, sewage, and drinking water, they stay or they go back. And we now have to debate what is happening in Jordan and in Lebanon. I was last week in Lebanon, I spoke to King Abdallah of Jordan, and there is a tremendous desire by those two governments, which you mentioned, which are hosting the biggest number next to Turkey of uh, Syrian refugees, uh, to those who want voluntarily to return, that something is happening in Syria. Now, are we blocking ourselves once again? Are we just the audience and watching who will do what kind of reconstruction? The last reconstruction conference that was done in Syria a few months ago was attended mostly by Asian companies. Or are we ready also to participate? Because, in, not to be cynic, but in the end, it's also a way of business opportunity for many. Mm. Uh, but we are lost in semantics. And I addressed that in my Arabic part at the General Assembly speech. And it was, it was very moving then to see how many people came towards me later on, and it was highly quoted in Arab media that this is the clue of the problem. Don't get lost in semantics, please. Do something about it. Get into action. What do you call it? Humanitarian assistance, stabilization or whatever. People need a house. And you, and you have to, to arrange for that. We are not uh, trustworthy if we say one dollar in the region is worth $135 in Europe. We have been talking about that for the last three years. But right now, when there's again a momentum to be seized, in order in particular to assist Turkey and uh, Lebanon and Jordan, we are still reluctant, we still look at our 
reconstruction or, or whatever, how do we call it? And this is something where people in the region are getting more and more frustrated. And that's how I got a very, very positive echo from large parts of the Arab media who watched my speech in Arabic. Thank you. Okay, so uh, closing remarks uh, briefly. Uh, clearly, uh, the uh, rationale for, for a debate on Europe uh, has been proved. Uh, we enter uh, unknown territory with the elections that were coming. There are, as Natalie said, it seems that the stakes are, are higher and people are more aware that this is a European level issue. Uh, we have the five scenarios which I think more or less grasp the possibilities of uh, where we are going. And uh, to quote uh, my friend and our friend Boris Marte, uh, who says, you know, our children in 10, 20 years' time will ask us, what did we do to save Europe or to help strengthen it? What, what are we doing and how do you see uh, those steps that will at minimally keep Europe the way it is, if not uh, make it better? Vesna Pusic. Oof. Europe is a bit like climate change. Everything, everybody knows it's there, it's urgent, it's very dangerous, <laughs> but at the same time, everybody's acting as if it's indestructible. I don't think it's indestructible. However, uh, generations that are in the majority now were born into European Union, into the existence of this uh, uh, political entity, but to some extent, we have not managed to communicate it or to somehow pass the torch. I don't think that the young generation today sees Europe as their project, as something that they are responsible for. And there is an enormous split between the individual decisions and political decisions. Individually, Young people in Europe are traveling back and forth, going from one country. Even countries are even complaining that too many young people are going, uh, traveling within Europe and going from one country to the other, looking for work, for education, for different things. But They're living in terms, a European life already. Li absolutely, personally. At the same time, a lot of young people, in, when they go into politics, into political parties, don't treat Europe as their project. On the contrary, a lot of them go into this project of you know, national sovereignty against Europe, not as part, as a building block of European sovereignty. And I would say it would be extremely important to find a way for the generations that are taking over this project, that have to lead it on, to feel it and think of it, to add something to it that's their own invention, that makes it their own, that doesn't make it, you know, Monet and Schumann and everything that was there, that makes it something that they want and do for themselves and that they will present to the people who come after them. I'm not sure how to do that, but I'm definitely sure that speaking out, speaking out of, for instance, this difference between when the populists come out, they come out fighting. When we come out, we mostly come out whining. <laughs> we should stand for what we believe in, and then maybe the people who are coming after us are going to believe us too. Thank, Thank you. you. Natalie Nogaret, final thoughts. I th thank you. I, I, I personally don't feel I'm whining. I, mean, I feel like I'm fighting for, for things no, that I care are. about. <laughs> um, but but, but it's a good... It's, exclude. I, think, um, I think it will... It, because we live in, in an era where we're all drenched with information and bad information sometimes and, you know, the fake news uh, uh, phenomenon. And uh, so I think that we all have individually to make a little effort, which is to, to try to think about exactly what, 
what is being said and to try to clarify what we are all talking about. For example, I'll just give you one example. I think the whole debate about migration uh, mixes different notions, but we're all confused by it. The notion of what is asylum, the notion of what is immigration within our European societies and sometimes second or third, third generation immigration. Um, the question of how do we, how do we relate to Islam uh, as, uh, in, in, in predominantly Christian countries. And these things are all mixed together by parties, again, who have condoned you know, <laughs> certain coalitions. Um, so I, I, I think we have to try to see through the fog. And this is difficult, and I work for a media organization, and I can tell you it's difficult to try to break through the fog and get some facts right and clarify the terms of what we speak about. And I think that uh, technical talk, which looks uh, uh, non-dangerous, which just looks bland or even common sense, can be dangerous. For example, and, uh, for example the talk we've just heard about Syria and Reconstruction. For, for me, the, I have so many questions that I would like to ask you, uh, Minister, but we don't have time. But for me, the question that rises in my head when I hear this talk is, does that mean that as Europeans who care about uh, human dignity and who are aware that in Syria there have been uh, approximately one, one half a million dead people, uh, ki people killed as a result of multiple onslaughts, uh, of which the, uh, the Russian and Iranian participation in the war were absolutely uh, you know, central to the, to the mass atrocities alongside Assad. Are we as Europeans next door to this catastrophe, which I think is, ranks as the, the, our, uh, a time-defining catastrophe for us all, and we know it's impacted our politics in Europe in many ways, are we going to accept the notion that uh, that we will quietly send back or encourage people to, who have sought protection in Europe to quietly push them back and Sorry, perhaps, I, and perhaps about then, people and perha to I, I was speaking about those who are living in Jordan and in Lebanon, if you yes. paid attention. And I also said it has to be in tandem with certain things that have to happen. But yes. I was speaking about Jordan and Lebanon, not about uh, Syrians who have come to Europe, just to make yes. that clear. Yes, okay, but uh, as Europeans, I, I understand from your comments that we would condone the notion of people returning to a Syria where there is no sign whatsoever of any kind of uh, political transition or settlement. Uh, if you are suggesting that as Europeans, wherever they would come from, we should condone the return of refugees to a place where you have uh, still in power uh, and consolidated by uh, external forces, Iran and Russia, a dictator who has massacred his own people but, but, to stay but, in but power. Here you're that is a European but here you're problem. dismissing what is happening. That is a European you're problem. Sorry, you're dismissing, maybe for lack of knowledge, you're dismissing of what is <laughs> happening. Facts. What is happening? Yeah, what is happening? We now have. Uh, uh, at the General Assembly, we also pushed for a high segment on Syria. We had various Syrian special envoys from the US and others there. And there's a tremendous diplomatic work on getting a constitutional committee on way. Stefan de Mistura is working hard on that. We are in constant contact with him. But on the other hand, you have people from the villages and you just have to listen to, to, the, to the Jordanians, you have to listen to the Lebanese what, when they see you. We have people here who want to go back, their cousin calls and say, listen, the village is more or less fine, there's no more war monitoring on here, you can come back. The people want to come back, but then it's all, and this is what the ICRC will tell you, <coughs> it's all about the basic service, and that's what we are talking about. We are talking about the humanitarian assistance, the humanitarian tragedy, that you have... And if Assad stays in power, that's fine, people can no, come No, I'm not saying yeah. that we are half in tandem, and that's whenever, and that's also what I said at the General Assembly, you can go through my speech. It has also been translated from Arabic. <laughs> uh, so, and there it says, we need, of course, in tandem, we need reforms, we need gestures, but you cannot be, stay behind the mantra and say, unless Assad goes, nothing will be done. And this is the mantra that is happening. And at the same time, we just sit by and watch, like people try to return, like people try to, to, to make a living. And also the war was a proxy war. We have also 
thousands of EU nationals who are there fighting. And what the Turkish government is right now trying to do in Idlib and try to sort out the worst movements from the less worst movements, a lot is happening behind the scenes in terms of genuine diplomacy. That is happening. And I'm not going to speak out here in stage of what is going on behind the screens because I believe in diplomacy. And this has nothing to do with speaking it up or writing about it before things are well done. Okay. Do you, you, at your, at your, uh, I'm going to raise it now, but at your wedding, you invited President Putin. And you, you, you said later, tell me if I'm wrong, that one of the issues you discussed with him was Syria. And he is a gr big proponent of having Europeans send back or encourage refugees to return to Syria right now. The, everybody is interested in having people from Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon try to find their way back home. And you have every week some hundreds of people who go back. What we spoke about Syria was how to get the different formats that you have. You have now at least You're not answering my question, but... No, uh, yes, yeah. that's, that, that's what we spoke about. Mm. We have three different formats discussing Syria and how to converge those. Because there has to be a diplomatic settlement. There has to be a moving from the current military ceasefires, so, several of them, into some sort of diplomatic settlement. And there are different talks in Astana, in Geneva, plus the format of six, where unfortunately you don't have the European Union, but you have Germany and France and the United Kingdom, but you do not have the common European voice also in there, which is a pity, because all what they are doing is all about constitutional reform. It's all about putting leverage on Damascus in order to make things happen, in order to make power sharing. That's what it is about. Okay. Natalie, anything else you want to add? Uh, or to, uh, uh, well, Syria, we could, Syria, we, could, we, we could won't resolve we, we here We could spend today. a whole hour on just Europe okay. and Syria. Okay. And uh, um, I think, um, I think I, what, I've, what I've felt is that there's genuine commitment to the European project, uh, uh, you know, uh, f from, from, from this stage. And I think in the room, I think we have to think about what kind of content we want to put in that European project. And uh, uh, that has to be centered on, on, no, that on, principles, on principles which are democratic rule of law, human rights, uh, 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 s peaceful settlement of, <coughs> of, of disputes, and, uh, and social justice, because we know that populism thrives on, on, on the, the sense of injustice that has perhaps grown. So I think, I think harnessing, and harnessing all the energy and making sure we defend that rule of law because far-right parties, as we see uh, in, in different European countries, are a threat to rule of law. They come, with you, they come towards us with the notion that they will protect us against foreign, external cultural invasion. But in fact, once they, are, once they have a foot in the door, they start dismantling democratic rule of law. They start threatening the things that actually protect our rights as citizens. And that's why I think we should be clear on what our problems, what our real problems are, and not the fake problems uh, that the populists want us to, to, to pay attention to. Norbert, uh, Rutgen, final uh, quick thoughts. Yeah, I think we are running out of time, so I will yes, be we have <laughs> perhaps just one quick remark to, to Russia and Syria. Although also the Russians under Putin perpetrated war crimes, we have to talk with them in order to insist on a political solution there. Hopefully, there is an interest by the Russians to also turn away from waging wars uh, uh, together with Assad and, and Hezbollah to come to, 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 to transform the military victories into political gains. So we have to engage in that, knowing and, and being explicit about the war crimes that happened. More general, I really consider and feel the European absence in, in these areas which are basically threats to Europe. <laughs> already as a, not only faltering, but failure of Europe. And my sense is that really for the first time, Europe can fail. 
I lack the imagination that this is really to happen. But we are so divided, fundamentally divided, we remain so inactive and unresponsive to what makes up our new reality, I think we are really at a crossroads and we are quite close to the brink. So the only message I would like to convey is we, it's urgent to take action. I think in a way we know what to be done, but the imperative is to take action, to start fighting, perhaps fighting back, but more and more fighting and more, more than that, fighting for Europe, because otherwise we all are doomed to lose. So start fighting for our values, for Europe, and this will be what is our task and our responsibility in, in the sight of the faces of our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Without any pretension to try and even summarize some of the debate, <laughs> I would like to simply conclude by saying that it seems that Europe is coming of age. It lived under a wonderful, cozy cocoon of transatlantic security framework from 1945, lived a brief period of the end of history mm -hmm. that ended uh, relatively quickly, we realize that history does not go away. Some of us, like Vesna and myself, who come from the former Yugoslavia, had to live it in the worst way. Geopolitics is back. Interests, as uh, Minister Kneissel said, that have never actually gone away. Mm. All politics is local, and thus we are hostage to our domestic political dynamics. Elections are won on a domestic level. But as Norbert Rotgen rightly said, if we do not become aware that our own domestic nation states will suffer if Europe goes down the drain, and as you said, this is possible. Empires have failed, but quote unquote, this European empire, which is not an empire, is by choice. If I dare say we Europeans yeah. and my country and I, as somebody from Belgrade and Serbia, wants desperately to join, notwithstanding the problems of Europe, it is because we chose willingly yep. to join institutions, democratic, rule of law based institutions that respect the human rights, the freedom of speech, the freedom of association, and an independent justice to protect us so that we would avoid what was coming. So I'd like to thank Minister Kneissel, Norbert Grotkin, Vesna Pusic, and Natalie Nurgared, and above all, you who have come to sacrifice your Sunday morning to be with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>